Thank you so much for joining us today for the AHA Foundation's webinar. At the AHA Foundation, we've been advocating for 10 years for state legislation that would outlaw female genital mutilation specifically. And we believe that this is very important because it would make it a much safer place for women and girls in the country. And we've had some really great success along the way in states like Michigan and Kansas and Texas and South Dakota and New Jersey. Um, but we still have our work cut out for us because even so, there are still 24 states that have not outlawed female genital mutilation. And even though the CDC has estimated that there are half a million girls who are at risk of or who have undergone FGM in the US, um, there still has never been a prosecution on the federal level for an individual who has cut little girls in the country. And we know that when our supporters reach out to their representatives, it makes a difference. And today we have two legislators who have been on the front lines fighting FGM in their states, and we'll hear from them soon. But let's talk first just a little bit briefly about what is FGM? What are we talking about today? Female genital mutilation, or FGM for short, is internationally known as a form of human rights abuse. It is something that is typically done to little girls from infancy to the age of around 12 or 13, sometime around puberty, um, but can happen a little bit later in life as well. It's the process of cutting away the skin that covers the clitoris, the clitoris, or in the most extreme forms, all of the external genitalia, and then sewing closed almost entirely the tissue so that there's only a small hole left for urination and menstruation. There are no health benefits for FGM, and there are lifelong health and psychological consequences that are associated with this practice. Uh, immediately following, there can be extreme bleeding and shock. A girl might suffer from infertility later in life, difficulties with menstruation, difficulties with intercourse, and obviously difficulties with childbirth. She also might face long-term psychological consequences like depression, PTSD, self-harm, and suicidal ideation. As I said before, only 26 states have outlawed female genital mutilation specifically. In this map that you see in front of you, the states that are shown in gray still do not have FGM legislation. And this is even though, as I said, the CDC has said that there are as many as 513,000 women and girls who are at risk of female genital mutilation in the United States. Today, we have the honor of speaking with two legislators who have stepped up and done something about this in their own states. And first we'll be speaking with Representative Stephanie Chang, who after she heard of the little girls being cut in her state, worked in an incredible bipartisan manner and passed the strongest FGM legislation in the country today. And we'll also be speaking with Representative Heather Siraki from the state of Maine. And Heather has fought doggedly and tirelessly in her state to try to pass legislation. It hasn't happened so far, but she hasn't given up yet. So we're gonna hear from both of them today. And something that I wanna make sure you all know watching this is that you can send your questions throughout. And at the end of, of our prepared questions, you'll have an opportunity to um, have your questions fielded to the, rep the representatives themselves. Feel free to send them throughout and we'll start sorting through them so that we've got them ready. But um, we'll have about 15 minutes probably at the end of the presentation where we'll be able to ask your questions. But you can go ahead and send them throughout using the control panel that you see on your screen. And my first question is for Representative Chang. Please tell us about your involvement with Michigan anti-FGM legislation. Sure, well, thank you so much uh, for having me. Uh, I really appreciate this opportunity. Um, so again, my name is Stephanie Chang. I'm the state representative for uh, House District 6 here in Michigan. And, uh, you know, when the cases first, when we first heard about the arrests that were made, um, honestly, it was, I was not at all familiar with what female genital mutilation was. I had never heard of it as a, a thing that could happen. Um, and when I heard that it was happening here in Michigan, I was shocked. Um, and I had a friend, um, Dr. R.C. Well, who called me out of the blue one day saying, you know, have you heard about this? I would really love for you to work with uh, Howe Foundation to uh, work on some legislation. So 
I immediately then, then submitted actually some, uh, a, a couple of bill requests. Um, and what ended up happening was that actually I had a Republican um, colleague who had also submitted basically the same bill request. And once I figured out, once we figured out that it, both of us had done the same thing because we were interested in trying to help combat this, we said, well, let's work together. Um, and things sort of spiraled from there. It started from two bills to really uh, realizing that there was a lot more to the issue and a lot more that we could do um, to be proactive. And um, so we ended up with a pretty comprehensive bill package um, that is bipartisan, pretty almost evenly split in terms of Democrats and Republicans as, as primary sponsors on these bills. Um, and it ranges everywhere from uh, the 15 year felony to revoking health of a revoking the license of a health professional to making it so that our state's Department of Health and Human Services does education and outreach to uh, community members from um, some of the communities that FGM is sort of a more commonly practiced uh, case. And then um, a couple of bills related to statutes of limitation, um, both on the criminal and on the civil side. Um, and my bill was actually on the civil side, it was basically to make sure that uh, when a girl becomes a woman that she still has 10 years before, uh, she still has 10 years in which she can actually file a lawsuit. Um, one of the things that we realized was that, you know, just we heard so many stories of, of um, you know, girls who didn't know what was going on and it wasn't until they became adults that they realized what had happened to them and we need to provide those those women with an opportunity to be able to take legal action so um i'm really proud of the work that we've done and obviously it's going to um be ongoing in terms of making sure that our state is doing everything that we can to um both address what's already unfortunately happened and is so tragic in our state but also to hopefully prevent this from happening again Great, thank you. It is it is incredible that that you managed to have such an evenly split bill. It seems almost impossible in our in our world today that that could happen, and that was very impressive. So the next question is for Representative Siraki, and our first question for you is: When did you first hear about FGM, and what drives your dedication to this cause? Well, I was first approached by um, someone who's not a direct constituent of mine, but is a resident of the state of Maine and wanted to know if I'd be willing to uh, sponsor a bill to prohibit female genital mutilation and I'd never heard of it. And so I did a little research on it and I was running for office at the time and I said, if I was to win the honor of being reelected that I would indeed put the bill in and I did, and it met with amazing support. I had um, Speaker of the House, a Democrat, and I'm a Republican. I had every every um, person in leadership co-sponsoring. I had Speaker of the House, as I said, I had the Senate President, I had all the um, majority leaders, minority leaders, assistance to the minority and majority leaders, um, uh, uh, a number of Democrats actually sought me out to co-sponsor the bill, and then they all flipped their positions. And the ACLU was a big factor um, in the state of Maine with changing um, opinions within the Democrat caucus, and um, and it ultimately failed by one vote. The um, the um, the way the bill evolved and was amended and the resistance we kept meeting with this bill was very frustrating and the more that time went on the more determined i became to pass this bill and um i had people giving me reports of people in the chamber when we were having the floor debates on this and i sit in the front row and i was told that grown men were actually crying during this bill. This is a really highly charged emotional bill. So I was just determined and I'm still determined. We have uh, uh, some other um, options in the works for this next session. In Maine, we were prohibited from introducing legislation to consecutive uh, years or even within the, the same year. Within a two-year session, you can only submit a bill once. 
And we did substantially change the bill. I asked for permission from Legislative Council to bring the bill back this session. They uh, denied me that, but they did allow a Democrat sponsored version of the bill, which is a very watered down version to move forward. And um, if that bill fails and we're unable to amend it, the governor has um, indicated strong support for putting his version of the bill in. So we're still moving on. That's great. I'm, I'm so glad to hear it. I'm so glad to hear it. Okay, our, our next question is for Representative Chang. And it's following the FGM cases coming to light in Michigan, what happened and what made it clear that FGM was a bipartisan issue in your state? So, you know, as I mentioned earlier, um, there was interest from both me and, and uh, Representative uh, Michelle Hoytinga, uh, who's a Republican state legislator here in Michigan. Uh, we were both submitting bill requests and working on it. And uh, so it really truly was a bipartisan effort. Um, I think that once we realized how serious this was, and once we started to get going on the original two bill requests, um, we just kept talking about it. I brought in our Democratic policy staff, and we also brought in the Republican policy staff, and uh, we realized that there was more we could do. Um, and from talking to, I'm also the chair of the Progressive Women's Caucus in uh, in our Michigan State Legislature. So, um, in talking with some of my Democratic women colleagues, we definitely realized that there was some interest from from uh, within our membership to be involved. Um, so, as we drafted the bills, we um, sort of shared uh, the ideas with various. Actually, the vast majority of the legislation was um, sponsored by women legislators. And that was something that both me and our, and Representative Hoytinga thought was really important was as this is something that affects women and girls to make sure that the vast majority of the bills were led um, and sponsored by women on both sides of the aisle. Um, and so it really was a partnership. You know, I'll be honest, I hardly ever vote the same way as Representative Hoytinga and like any other sort of on any controversial issue. Um, but this was something where we just, really felt strongly about how serious this is um, in terms of just a horrific, uh, tragic thing that shouldn't be happening in 2017 in the United States of America, or let alone anywhere in the world. Um, and so I think that both of us were really outraged at the fact that it was happening here in our home state. Um, and so it just was through the course of lots of conversations, several work group meetings, and lots and lots of revisions to the bills that we were able to um, get it done. And it was interesting because I actually, there was a, a couple of Democrats who I was wondering how they were going to feel about the bills, but um, they actually really were fully on board um, because they realized just that this is something that Michigan needed to be a leader on. Um, and so I'm really proud of our bipartisan work. And I think it kind of is a model for you know, it sort of gives me hope on other legislative issues that I work on is that, you know what, we can actually, we can do things together across party lines and that's the way that she, things should go. Absolutely, and it really is such a, a great example of that. And I was also, you know, I, I think it's terrific that you had such amazing women leadership on these bills, but it seemed also like the, the men in Michigan in the legislature really, really got it and were on board as well. So that was neat to see too. So Representative Siraki, we know that you have, have faced quite a few challenges in getting this legislation passed in Maine. Can you talk to us a little bit about what those obstacles are that, that you've been facing? Oh, absolutely. Thank you. Um, you know, um, I was rereading um, part of Ayan Hirsi Ali's book, and in the introduction, she says something. She says, some things must be said, and there are times when silence becomes an accomplice to injustice. And I think that that is so true. Just speaking up on this was so shocking to so many people that um, part of the challenge for us was people didn't believe it was happening. They truly did not believe this could be happening in the state of Maine. Why do we need a law when something's not happening? So part of my big challenge was proving that something was happening. And 
we began our legislative session in January, and I believe it was February when the case in Michigan broke. And I was like, see, it's happening in the United States. It's right, there's a, there's a case right here, right now. That wasn't enough. Um, so I then um, went through a, a bunch of different things where I went to the um, person in the governor's office that we deal with for health and human services issues. And I used to serve on the HHS committee. And I asked him, I said, I'm a mandated reporter. I work in a dental office. And if a provider, a nurse, a doctor, anyone suspects that a child has been cut in this manner, don't they need to report this? And they said, absolutely, this is considered child abuse. And so I said, well, as mandated reporters, how many reports has the state of Maine ever had regarding FGM? Because one of our cities in Maine has 11% Somalian population. And according to UNICEF, the country of Somalia has about a 98% cutting rate. So basically 100% of the females are, are mutilated from Somalia. So it stood to reason that there would be at least one that was in the state of Maine. And we have such a large population in two of our cities, but especially in one of them. And they ran a report for me and there were absolutely no reports at all. Whereas at the same time, last year in 2016, actually, um, in, the, in the United Kingdom, there were over 5,000 cases reported. Now they've never had a prosecution in the United Kingdom, but their mandated reporters are actually reporting FGM, but no prosecutions. And so I asked, well, what's the penalty in the state of Maine if a provider fails to report? So if I knew about it, but failed to report, what happens to me? Uh, basically nothing. They might fine you a $500 fine, but who's going to report you? And so then I asked them to run the main care, which is our version of Medicaid, the Medicaid billing codes. And ICD-10 codes came out in 2013. They're brand new billing codes for Medicaid services. And they have several that are specific to female genital mutilation. So I had them run very generic um, report for me that showed that three of those FGM ICD-10 billing codes had been billed out by providers in Maine involving eight different individuals in Maine. Now that's not saying our provider is performing FGM, they are fixing it, they're repairing it. Either there was a, a, an infection or some surgery needed to take place we don't know the ages of the females. We don't know any other data. Just, just we have proof now that it was hap there was something going on here and that Medicaid was paying for services billed to the state of Maine to somehow deal with the issue. And so that was about the only real proof I could get except for anecdotal stories where um, someone in the House Republican office told me he knew of a nurse in one of the hospitals. Now, this is a nurse. She's a mandated reporter. And two young girls had brought themselves into the hospital. And one of the girls, um, they were very sick. They had to get permission from a parent to come in. That was quite an ordeal. They finally got permission from one of the parents. These two girls were not sisters. And one of them had a very bad infection. She had been recently cut. And the other one was stitched up so tightly she could not urinate at all. Her urine was backing up into her kidneys and she was going septic. And this was happening in Maine within the last year. They claim there are about 400 young girls that are um, at risk in the state of Maine, according to one report that we have. And my challenge not only involved trying to convince people that it was happening, but was to say, what is the harm in having a bill if we never use it. We have a lot of bills on, we have a lot of laws on the books that we use as deterrents that we never actually use. And this one here could actually prevent child abuse. And in my mind, this is not only child abuse, this is sexual assault, and this is even rising to domestic violence. I mean, this is a really horrific um, crime that is involving young children that have no voice, no one speaking up for them, and people too worried about um, even to report this because they're worried about how that will be viewed as being um, a racist type thing. So as the bill progressed, I was accused um, 
um, of, of being motivated by hate. So that was another challenge for me. And I said, you know, you're absolutely right. I hate child abuse. And so the, the way to try to kill the bill in Maine anyway, was to denigrate the sponsor of the bill, to impugn and question one's character. It became very personal in the state of Maine. And from reports I heard from other legislators in other states, it, it was a very similar thing. And we incorporated an education and outreach program into the bill. Um, and we had, uh, we have some financial challenges here in the state. I was able to get that without to be done with inexisting resources. Um, we uh, amended the bill to try to accommodate just as much as we could. At the end of the day, it failed by one vote. I was only able to convince three Democrats to come with me. Um, so it was a really, um, it was a tough, it was a tough bill. <laughs> and the ACLU's claims were, um, and this was another challenge, was that the current penal code is already adequate. We don't need to expand the penal code code and that every one of these charges could already be um, successfully prosecuted under existing law. And I would encourage every legislator to make sure as part of your stakeholder group to have your prosecutors association involved with you because they need to prosecute this crime. And they had really valuable information. For one thing, I didn't understand that while it is prohibited at the federal level, state prosecutors cannot prosecute federal law. You must have it codified in your own state laws. And the clearer and more specific it is, the easier for the prosecutors. And one of the questions we had that came up late in the game was the, the issue of birth certificates. Many of these children come here from countries where they don't have a birth certificate. And when it comes to prosecuting the crimes, the prosecutors were upset because the birth date that's assigned to a child to attend school is arbitrary. There are many on the January 1st of a year or the July 1st of a year. But when it comes to prosecuting for a crime, all of a sudden the parents will say, wait a minute, wait a minute, that wasn't really their birth date. It was a different date in order to adjust it so that they wouldn't be um, able to be prosecuted. And my, bills, uh, my bill did um, specifically uh, apply to under age 18. So those were some of the challenges. Wow, I'm I'm so impressed, and and we have been impressed at at your tenacity in working to get this passed in in the face of such um, kind of overwhelming obstacles. It feels like, and and I'm so impressed that you're still moving forward. And I think that the point that you made about about having the prosecutors involved in the discussion around the legislation and what it needs to look like and, and the fact that it needs to be there is, is a great one. And it's actually also a perfect segue into my next question for Representative Chang, which is how did you work with stakeholders in crafting this legislation? Yeah, thank you. And, um, you know, hearing Rep. Soraki really kind of made me think through, you know, what is it that we did and, and maybe, you know, maybe how can we help you guys in Maine? Uh, so, uh, Amanda at the AHA Foundation was just like tremendous in providing, you know, both um, background material and testifying um, via not Skype, but some other sort of technology um, into our committee hearing to testify. And um, at the local level, you know, talk to the prosecutors, talk to the defense attorneys, talk to the ACLU of Michigan. You know, the ACLU did also have concerns. I mean, I'm, they sort of follow, I'm assuming follow the lead and share information between all the states. Um, they did express concern. Um, of like, I don't think that they were actually formally opposed, um, although I might be getting that wrong. I'll have to check back. Um, I think one of the things that helped is that because I'm a Democrat and because I um, have a pretty clear track record on um, other civil liberties type issues that the ACLU works on. I have a really good relationship with them. And by the fact that I gave, you know, my friends at the Criminal Defense Attorneys of Michigan a heads up, um, I find that a lot of times people just appreciate knowing well in advance that something is coming. And especially knowing that, you know, I have a good relationship with those organizations. Um, you know, there was 
no one testified in opposition uh, in committee. And wow. um, and I think uh, we also had, you know, medical professionals and other and women's groups and things like that that were engaged. Um, but it really, I think, because we sort of gave a lot of people a heads up and to tell people this is what's going on, this is what's happening, um, we ended up not really having any opposition, uh, or at least not any formal opposition. I will tell you there were a few uh, Democrats who did have some questions and concerns. Um, and I think in just sort of going back to what Representative Siraki had said about, um, you know, misconceptions about this either targeting a certain group or something like that, um, we did have a cup, you know, at least one colleague who asked that type of question. Um, but ultimately, I tried to be really clear that for me, this is this is not about religion. This is about um, making sure that we're protecting young girls, um, and and it's about their health and well-being. Um, and this is a crime. It should be made a crime on Mich uh, on the books in Michigan, and so. Um, it was something where I think through, it was just a lot of advanced conversation with people, letting people know it was coming, and then also making it a really strong bipartisan package um, by having names of lots of respected women legislators on the bill package. I think it helped people to understand like, okay, well, this is something that we got to pay attention to and, and make sure that we're, um, you know, following, so. So you did a lot of homework to, to make sure that once you got to committee that that it was going to be smooth sailing, it sounds like. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Okay, my next question is for Representative Siraki, and it's how are Maine residents helping and what more could they do to help you get this legislation <laughs> finally passed? I, I can say that in the state of Maine, the actual residents are absolutely 100% behind me. I had basically a media blackout on this bill and um, very little coverage. And the little bit we did have for coverage spurred Democrats from the most, I mean, the, the most progressive liberal female Democrats were calling me um, and expressing outrage and disappointment and frustration. They could not understand why the bill didn't pass. They really were struggling with this. It wasn't the residents that were um, opposed in any way. They were actually extremely supportive. Um, and they they wanted to know more about it and they were happy to come testify in support if that would help in any way. Um, they were calling their state senators, their state reps to, to express disappointment with their votes and to try to ask them why and what the hang up was and, and what, the, what the issue was. And, um, and really struggling to try to figure out what went wrong here. And because we had so much initial support and then it all turned around. Now, I mean, a big part of the problem in Maine is the political climate. Part of it was the bill and part of it was the ACLU, but I did have a number of Democrats tell me that um, basically their biggest problem with the bill was that a Republican sponsored it and they wanted credit for it. So they wanted to wait until I was termed out and they would be bringing the bill back with them as sponsors. And so they have already done that. And so that's what we're going to be looking at in January. And um, they were very, uh, the, the Democrats also were extremely uh, uncomfortable with um, 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 criminalizing the parents in any way with this bill. They had no problem making the person doing the cutting, the actual person doing the procedure as a criminal activity with a class A crime, which is a 15 year felony in the state of Maine, but they didn't want to have any crime level at all affiliated with 
a parent or guardian or someone who was involved with basically an accomplice to child abuse, making the phone call, making the arrangements, possibly helping hold them down, hold their legs apart. They didn't want to, um, they didn't, they, they felt that this was really a, um, 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 this could have a backlash in the immigrant community. They didn't want to be viewed as anti-immigrant in any way and did not want to be on record as um, as as going that far. They, they, they could criminalize the cutting, which in it, from all reports I'm hearing, the cutting is not happening in the state of Maine, it's happening in a different state. So because our state laws can't be prosecuted in another state, that makes the law basically worthless. <laughs> So you have to be able to criminalize the parents. The parents are making the arrangements to have this done. And so in my view, um, I mean, you can pass a feel good bill if we want just to say, pat ourselves on the back. Oh, great. We criminalized FGM for the cutting, which isn't even happening here. You have to be able to criminalize and prosecute the um, parents as well. And um, um, I, I would say that, um, it's um, to try to bring people together on this issue. Like I said, we started off what seemed really tight, ready to go. And it seemed like it would, it, it, how could this fail? And the public has been nothing but supportive. I have to say that. That's great. You know, one thing that you're talking about the parents and one thing that, that we've heard anecdotally on, on quite a few occasions here at the AHA Foundation and working with families and communities that practice FGM, is families who are on the fence about whether or not this is something that they want to do or who are actively resisting family members from their countries of origin saying that you know that that don't want to do this use legislation as an excuse for not doing it i mean i think that all of us can agree that the best case scenario of, of putting this legislation in place is that it doesn't happen again i mean that's that's what we don't want to punish anyone we just want it to stop so i you know i know from speaking with families that they say listen we would, we would totally do this you know, to their family members back at home. We would totally do this, but we know that we're gonna get in a lot of trouble if we do, and we're just not gonna face going to jail. So we can't, we just can't do it. And, and to me, that is a, a huge argument for, for criminalization in general, but also in, in criminalization against the parents. Right. So my next question is for Representative Chang. Um, and what would you say to constituents from your state or, or actually not, not your state now because you've got FGM legislation in your state, um, but what would you say to constituents in, in other states to um, tell them how to get legislation where there is none if they don't have FGM legislation in their state? What would you say to them to, to do to get this going? That's a great question. I would definitely say, well, one, of course, contact your own state legislator and say have you are you aware you know because i think um for me and it sounds like for rep Siraki, it literally just took a phone call from someone that we knew and there's a lot of legislators who maybe just have no idea that this is something that happens um so i wouldn't go in to any conversation with a legislator assuming that they even have any idea uh what fgm is um and so even just asking you know this case is going on in michigan or you know um, I heard that this is happening. Um, are you aware of it? And just sort of starting that conversation because um, because I think you just need that we deal with so many issues in our state legislatures that um, that uh, and there's so many uh, so many things going on that I think you know you just kind of have to assume that we may not know exactly what you what you're what you want us to work on. So I think sharing your concern and sharing your knowledge and also saying sharing the aha foundation as a resource um, and saying you know are you interested in working on this issue i know of this organization they helped people craft legislation in other states um, and just starting that conversation um, one other thing i would say is maybe to try to find are there local organizations that could help you push are there um organizations that serve women and girls that might take an interest um, and then also to think about like what is the political climate of your state um, what is the best kind of makeup of um you know if if you were to able if you were able to find one or two legislators 
to work on bills together. Doesn't need to be a Republican and Democrat. If you're in a totally Republican state, then maybe you don't need a Democrat. You know, just thinking through like, well, what is the best makeup of um, of a bill package to make sure that it is successful um, and that it's a win for everyone politically and good policy uh, to help girls. So, um, so I guess to recap that, you know, start with assuming we don't know anything contact them and provide resources and information and three you know think about like strategically what's the best uh combination of people uh, and champions that you think will work hard to to get it done i love that i love that i think that's really great advice so representative Siraki, you you've already touched on this a little bit but what are what are the next steps in maine what's going to happen now well, right now we have um, a, a bill that's going to be moving forward. We have yet to see the fine print on it. Um, uh, I anticipate that we're going to probably have a minority report on this. I don't know um, if the Democrats will go along with the criminalization of the parents. And so that will be a huge sticking point. If that bill fails, um, then we'll be looking at a governor's bill to try to tighten things up. I have to say, I wanna thank um, Representative Shane because I think some of the things that are in the Michigan bill would be really great additions to a main bill that we didn't have um, initially. And that would be to be able to revoke the license of the provider. That was not in our original bill. And I really like that idea. And that they also the 10 year extension on the um, civil side to be able to file a lawsuit. I really like that as well. And um, and and then I think I mentioned to you the problem with the birth date, trying to nail that down. I have had our law library in the state of Maine try to find not just FGM legislation, any legislation anywhere on any issue trying to deal with this birth date issue and there is nothing. So this would be landmark legislation, which makes it really hard because you're you're not able to, we're, we, we're inventing the wheel, we're not reinventing the wheel. So we've got to try to figure out how we can write that language clearly so that other states can use that as a model too. We don't want to get that wrong. And, but that seems to be a really important piece for the, um, the prosecutors um, here. Um, just to mention, it's something similar over in New Hampshire, which is right next door to us, there was a case that was thrown out by their court system, which was really troubling to the prosecutors here in the state of Maine. And that had to deal with a domestic violence situation. It was uh, um, um, immigrants that um, she was 27 weeks pregnant. It was a domestic violence situation. And um, he pled cultural incompetence meaning he didn't understand our culture and he didn't understand that you can't beat up your pregnant wife. And that, um, that really troubled the main prosecutors here that to see a case thrown out like that just highlighted and stressed once again, the importance of having clear, specific state laws. You must have state laws that are very clearly defined so that they so that if a crime occurs that you can prosecute it and that um, people who maybe don't understand our laws but are living here need to understand they have to abide by our laws and these are very clear and specifically um, stated. Absolutely, that is, um, there, there is, ignorance is, is no, uh, no excuse for breaking the law. No. Um, so, you, I, you keep giving me these amazing segues for my questions. Uh, this, is, this, is, this is awesome. So I, I was actually just going to ask Representative Chang. So even though we have a federal law that will put someone in prison for up to five years for FGM, um, why do we still need state legislation in addition to that federal legislation? A great question. I think that uh, one of the things that you said earlier in the webinar um, really just rings true. I think uh, hearing about the case in Michigan and knowing that the girls um, that triggered this whole conversation in Michigan were from Minnesota, um, you know, they were, they were, they came from another state. Um, 
they came from a state where FGM was already a crime. And although I don't know all the details of exactly what happened and how it happened, um, how it came to be that they came to Michigan. Um, and I, I would assume a lot of that's being uncovered right now, but um, it seems that uh, because Michigan doesn't, didn't have um, anything on the books that perhaps that was one of the reasons why um, they came to Michigan to get the procedure done. Um, and so I think that although there's federal legislation, it seems really clear that local prosecutors want to be able to help stop this practice and help prosecute, um, but they can't unless they have something uh, in the state statute. And so I think that it is really important that state legislation get done in as many states as possible, um, especially where there are large populations where culturally it has been in the past, um, you know, culturally accepted. And so um, for Michigan, I think that it, it was a really clear example because we had the case, um, but also because um, it sort of exposed how uh, horrific and potentially widespread this was without anyone even knowing about it. Um, and so I think um, that, again, it's to help prevent it from happening. And also, you wouldn't want girls from another state. I mean, it's just mind blowing, honestly. Like why, it is horrible thinking about the fact that perhaps our state was targeted as a place to get this done um, because we did, did not have um, anything in the, in the statute. So um, I think that it's really important that everyone um, keep plugging away, keep advocating, try to really make the case that state legislation is something that's needed. It's something that more and more states are doing. There um, are clear signs that it can be a bipartisan issue um, and just keep that drumbeat going. Absolutely, I, I couldn't agree more. Um, one thing that I, I would add that that we think about at the AHA Foundation when we're looking at state FGM legislation is, is it also has this great ability to fill gaps in, in the federal legislation. There are federal legislators right now who are working with a bill called the SAFE Act to try to strengthen the federal uh, the federal law to make it a crime that would be punishable by up to 15 years in prison, but there's still not that education and outreach piece that can really be addressed with state legislation. And that's something that, that we really like to see when bills are passed on a state level as well. So all of these reasons, you know, to keep it from happening, to keep a state from becoming a destination for FGM, and also to fill those gaps that are left at the federal level for us is, you know, they're, they're great reasons for enacting state legislation. Okay, and we've already got some amazing questions in from our audience. So I'm not gonna I'm not gonna pause here to try to get questions in, but keep sending them in. So if you have a question that you haven't sent our way, feel free to send them over. The first one I'm gonna go to is from Cynthia Cynthia. And she says, for 20 years, immigration judges have been granting asylum to women and families because of FGM and have ordered that families do not have to return to a whole country because of this practice. It seems hard to reconcile a state would not recognize this harm within a girl's home when immigration courts see the harm from returning persons to a whole country. Please comment. And I think, I think that would be great for either of you. I, well, uh, I, go ahead. <laughs> go ahead. I, I was just going to say, I, I, I agree. It's hard to fathom um, why a state law would not support this. And basically, even to just codify what's in federal law, um, if you're going to just do at the most basic level, you would do that. And I think the uh, federal law, it, it prohibits vacation cutting. And of course, federal, federal law would cross state lines, but um, our law, and I think Michigan's also prohibits uh, crossing state lines. So um, there's no, it, it doesn't give it as an excuse to be able to travel to, for instance, from Maine to Massachusetts um, to do this. He, it's just prohibited, um, regardless of which, which state it's in, although we can't prosecute if it happens in, this, in the state of Massachusetts. Um, but we, um, we make it clear that it's not, that that's not an excuse, just because Massachusetts doesn't have a prohibition doesn't mean it's okay. And, and it is a, um, it's just, it defies logic to me as to why anybody would not prohibit this. But 
Um, there was one other reason that, um, that one other stumbling block we ran into that we didn't mention earlier, and that was from the um, transgender crowd. They were very concerned that removing genitalia for someone who wanted to begin the transgender process under age 18 would be involving removing genitalia. And um, that uh, we, we tried to address by um, saying if it was medically necessary and a doctor felt it was medically necessary that um, for instance, if you had cancer or some other issue um, involving female genitalia for medical purposes, um, something could be done, but not for cultural purposes, um, and certainly not for the reasons um, that FGM is, is typically performed. I mean, mutilation is different than having a surgical medical procedure done. And so we did try to uh, address it that way. Um, but, in, but in many people's opinions, um, um, beginning the transgender process under age 18, um, some people were very comfortable prohibiting it regardless and saying, really, you should wait until you're 18. That's an interesting stumbling block to, to come across. And it just, it's, it's a great example of things that you might never expect to be something that comes up during working on this legislation. And, and I think that looking at the medically necessary question was a really good idea in, in how to tackle that that mm -hmm. issue that, that you found. Representative Chang, did you have a did you have a thought on on why we are happy to condemn this practice overseas and, and why our immigration courts are happy to say um, you, you you know to help protect women and girls from going back to a country where they might be cut um, as a human rights abuse and and still we're seeing states that are not passing this law? Yeah, I think that um, whoever asked the question, I mean, you're spot on. I think it's a really important point to make. And um, as you're advocating within your own state, um, that's an important point to bring up. And and I think it's also really um, useful, at least in, I think in our case, one of the things that I thought was useful was to talk about how the United Nations has um, quite a bit, quite a bit of language about how this is, this is, you know, something that needs to be ended, FGM needs to be ended worldwide. And so I think sometimes, unfortunately, um, we talk about all of these goals as a world, and then we forget to look in our own backyard as far as what's happening um, in terms of human rights violations. Um, and so I think to bring that home to say, the United Nations says this is wrong, and we're trying to end it around the world. We need to start by looking at what's happening right here in our own state. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, Representative Chang, my next question is for you. Alex wrote in ahead of the webinar to ask, were there any other states that you looked towards when you were when you were working on your legislation? You're, you truly do have um, what, what we think of as the strongest state legislation against FGM. Were there other states that you looked at as models that might have legislation in process or that have already passed legislation? Oh gosh. Okay, so it's been a few months and I can't remember all of them. Um, but I can tell you, ask Amanda <laughs> because she knows everything. Um, and so, yes, we did look at other states. I apologize that I cannot remember off the top of my head because I've sort of moved on in my brain to try to work on other stuff. Um, but, um, and actually it was helpful to be able to point to, you know, here's these other states that are doing this. I think at the time it was 20 something, 20 something other states. Well, right now there are 26 states that have passed. That's including Michigan. So it was 25 including when you were working on it. Yeah. Got it. Um, yes. One of the states that we looked at when we were working on this together was the state of Massachusetts, which is still right. working very hard to get this passed. But they have, they have a lot of great aspects to their legislation. Like they have extended the, um, the period when you can report this and still have it prosecuted. So that's something that that we looked to them to, as an example. So. There are other states that are doing some really great, great work here on the on putting in, in place great ideas for legislation too. So my next question is from Erin in Pennsylvania, and she says, "What strategies can be used to proactively engage those like the ACLU who may oppose the bill?" And I think this is a great one for you, Representative Chang, because obviously you you were able to successfully navigate this and I know that part of it was was doing your homework and working with them in advance. Do you have any other tips on, on working with with organizations that might come out in um, opposition to the legislation? 
So that's a really good question. Um, I think every state is different in terms of what the politics look like. Um, for me, I have a very close relationship with the ACLU, as I mentioned, as someone who has helped them out on a lot of other issues. And I actually used to work for the ACLU. So it, um, because that relationship existed, it was, it sort of paved the way for just honest conversations about like, I'm not doing this as an anti-Muslim thing. Like you guys know that I actually have helped try to combat anti-Muslim um, sentiment in our state. And so um, just to be maybe trying to find a champion. I mean, I think part of it is I'm a woman of color. Like I, like I, like clearly I, you know, just knowing, um, trying to find, maybe find a champion who can help you work on this issue, who, is clearly aligned with the ACLU on, on you know, 95% of issues I think can help because that person will be able to have the conversations with them about this is why I'm doing it. It's for girls. It's not at all an anti-Muslim thing. And, and for me, I think I, you know, as I was talking to my colleagues, I said, I would not be co-sponsoring or sponsoring or co-sponsoring any of this legislation if it, if I thought that any of it was going to, you know, be used um, in an anti-Muslim way, in any way. And so, and I'm also happy to try to talk to people in your state. And, you know, if I can be helpful, um, you know, please reach out to me um, either through the AHA Foundation or you can just, you know, look me up on the internet and um, send me an email. Um, but I think um, obviously every state is different and obviously the ACLU is, is they will, they will be around and obviously chime in, but I think um, there are definitely ways to, to sort of work with them. And um, I would just need to know a little bit more about what's going on in Pennsylvania to be able to like really help you figure that out. But um, maybe through some conversation, we can get there. That's, that's really helpful. And also very generous of you to offer to, to help strategize on this. And I just wanna also make it very clear that, that at the AHA Foundation, we've worked on legislation in many states and um, you know, it's it's very rare that that we have seen opposition from the ACLU. So I think it feels like we're picking on them a little bit at the moment. But this is certainly not something we've seen from them across the board. You know, I know that they're very strong in protecting girls' rights. So I don't want it to seem like like that's what we're doing. Um, so my next question, and we've only got just a, a few more minutes left, but um, my next question is for Representative Siraki, and she says it's from Helen, and she says opposition to the main proposal was that the law would drive the practice underground and education was a better way. How do you counteract that argument? Well, I spoke with the um, person, bless you, bless you. Um, with, which the, with the director of the Immigration Resource Center um, and she indicated to me, she's a Muslim, that, that each of the new immigrants that come to the Immigration um, Center are informed and are aware that FGM is illegal. And so what we did was I worked with HHS. They had literature, they have contracts and, and reach out to the um, immigrant population already. And they had an out education outreach program ready to roll out to augment what was already happening in immigrant communities in Maine. Now, Maine doesn't have a large immigrant population per se, but we do have um, hubs in some specific specific areas. So in a way, they're very it's very easy to reach out and and reach reach them. Um, and the education and outreach program was one of the options. There were four reports that came out of my bill, so which is very unusual. Usually, you have a bill. And you might have a minority report, so you have two versions, but to have four versions of the same bill come out of a 13 member committee is unusual. So you had two members here, one person there, four people there, you know, it was, it was all over the map. And um, the, um, one of the reports was only an education and outreach program, which was going to funnel money into um, one of the outreach programs specifically. So it was, it was basically, a, a, um, in my opinion, it was a money grab. It wasn't really to, to, it wasn't going to do anything more than what we had, were able to do within existing resources through already established contracts. So um, there, 
there may be a way to be um, culturally sensitive and get this information out. But at the end of the day, we want to send a clear message that the answer is no. And and in many people's eyes, looking at this only as an education outreach program with absolutely no criminalization and no prohibition really had no teeth in it at all. There was no, there was, it basically was saying, hey, you know, if you see a bank robber, I think I'll give you a brochure and tell you, you know, you really shouldn't rob a bank, but there's going to be no crime attached to this. To me, you had to be able to say, I'm sorry, but this is child abuse. Here's the crime. If you commit this crime, this will be the penalty that you pay for committing this crime and clearly outline what it is. To me, it had to be much more than just an education and outreach program. And I thought what we had compromised, worked together, come up with a reasonable solution. We were able to get buy-in from some people on that, but it clearly, um, clearly prohibiting and criminalizing FGM was just too far for them to go. And it already is underground. I mean, how can you drive it any more underground than it already is? We don't even have one report from mandated reporters in the state of Maine, and yet we have other reports that it's definitely happening in hospitals from providers treating it. Well, we are really excited to see what is going to happen next in Maine, and we are rooting for you, and we will be here cheering for you and, and supporting you, and hopefully we're going to get this passed in the next couple of months in the state of Maine. Um, I know we've got a couple people who are writing in specific questions about their states, and I would point you to our website, theahafoundation.org, for specific state information. Also, the Population Reference Bureau has some great information on specifics about where there are high numbers of women and girls at risk. And you can also email us at the info account um, at the AHA Foundation, which is info at theahafoundation.org. And we are happy to help you figure out what's going on in your state, who you want to contact, and that kind of thing. Um, and for those of you who live in these states that are shown in gray that still do not have a law that specifically outlaws FGM, we would really just encourage you to reach out to your legislators. Um, we know that, that we have some great people in office. Our panelists today are, are terrific examples of, of people who can really take leadership and, and take on this issue. And, and so um, we're here to help you if, if you need help. But, we just hope that you're inspired after this webinar to take action in your own state and really work with your legislators to try to get legislation passed that would outlaw FGM on a state level. And I just want to say thank you to all of you for joining us today. This is something obviously that's very dear to our hearts and it's um, incredibly important that we all take it seriously because it's happening here in the United States in numbers that more, you know, bigger numbers than most people would imagine. And um, I want to give a special thanks today to Representative Siraki and Representative Chang, you two are, are truly leaders and, and we are honored to work with you and support you. Thank you so much for joining us today. And thank you for inviting you. us on. Really appreciate it. Thanks. Have a great afternoon, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.